On the 19th of September 2022, the nation fell silent as we paid our final respects during the state funeral of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. As Head of State, the Commonwealth and Commander-in-Chief of the British Armed Forces, she served the nation for over 70 years. The admiration she held for her armed forces was a common thread throughout her truly remarkable life. A life of dedication. The young princess was born on the 21st of April 1926 at 17 Bruton Street in Mayfair. The first child of Prince Albert, Duke of York, and his wife Elizabeth, Duchess of York, she was born into a naval family. Her father served before and during the Great War, including at the Battle of Jutland on the battleship HMS Collingwood. In December 1936, after the abdication of her uncle, King Edward VIII, her quiet family life came to an end. Her father acceded to the throne as King George VI, and from then on, the young princess was the first in line to the throne. In 1937, she joined her parents aboard the old Royal Yacht Victoria and Albert at the Coronation Fleet Review, the first of many such gatherings of naval might she would attend over the next 75 years. A few years later, she was hosted by young Prince Philip Mountbatten, while the King and Queen visited Britannia Royal Naval College in Dartmouth. During the war years, the young princess spent most of her time at Windsor Castle, continuing with her education, studying art and music, and learning to ride horses. She also continued her royal duties by giving her first radio broadcast during the BBC's Children's Hour. In wishing you all good evening, I feel that I am speaking to friends and companions who have shared with my sister and myself many a happy children's hour. Thousands of you in this country have had to leave your homes and be separated from your fathers and mothers. We are trying to do all we can to help our gallant sailors, soldiers and airmen. And we are trying too to bear our own share of the danger and sadness of war. My sister is by my side and we are both going to say good night to you. Come on, Margaret. Good night, children. Good night, and good luck to you all. The Queen's relationship with the armed forces really began in 1945, when, as Princess Elizabeth, she joined the Auxiliary Territorial Service, becoming the first female member of the royal family to join the armed services as a full-time member. During her time in the ATS, the princess learned to drive and maintain vehicles, and from that point on, the Queen maintained a very close relationship through regular visits to naval establishments and ships, and she held many military appointments and honorary ranks throughout her lifetime.
In July 1947, the engagement of Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten to Princess Elizabeth was announced and the marriage took place in Westminster Abbey on the 20th of November of that year. Shortly before the wedding, the bridegroom was given the title of Duke of Edinburgh and appointed Knight of the Garter by King George VI. After their marriage, the young couple spent their honeymoon at Broadlands in Hampshire and at Burkhall in Balmoral. They were able to live a relatively private life, with the Duke pursuing his naval career whilst the Princess cared for a young Prince Charles. From 1949 to 1951, she was a royal princess, naval wife and mother, living in Malta while Prince Philip was serving with the Mediterranean fleet as first lieutenant of HMS Chequers and then in command of HMS Magpie. Malta was said to hold very fond memories for the couple, who looked back on their carefree time there fondly later in life. On February the 6th, 1952, she received the news of her father's death and her own accession to the throne whilst on an official visit to Kenya. The new queen and the Duke of Edinburgh immediately flew back to Britain, returning to Clarence House, where the royal standard was flown for the first time in her reign. The coronation took place in Westminster Abbey on the 2nd of June, 1953, and the ceremony was broadcast on radio around the world, and at the Queen's request, on television for the very first time. An estimated 27 million people in Britain watched the ceremony as the Archbishop of Canterbury anointed Her Majesty. As head of the Commonwealth, the Queen played an important role in reinforcing the links that joined people together across the globe. She made more than 200 visits to Commonwealth countries, spanning many regions, religions and cultures, with her first official visit being to South Africa in 1947 as Princess Elizabeth. During her reign, the Commonwealth grew from just seven nations to 56, representing two and a half billion people. Her royal duties included meeting Queen Saloti of Tonga in 1953, the opening of the Sydney Opera House in 1973. She attended 22 Commonwealth Heads of Government, seven Commonwealth Games, and since 1977, Commonwealth Day has been celebrated throughout the Commonwealth almost every year of her reign. Although Her Majesty travelled extensively to many countries across the globe, she still managed to support her armed forces, especially the Royal Navy. Few people launched more ships than Her Majesty. Her first, at just 18 years old, was the mighty battleship HMS Vanguard. 
In the seven decades that followed, no year went by without Her Majesty being involved with the senior service. Launchings, commissionings, official openings and visits to ships and units all demonstrated the admiration she held for the Royal Navy. Of the numerous vessels she sponsored since launching HMS Vanguard, only two remain in service today. HMS Lancaster, the Queen's frigate, and the aircraft carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth. A home away from home, her beloved Royal Yacht Britannia served the royal family for over 44 years. Hosting state visits, royal honeymoons, banquets and family holidays, Britannia was a majestic symbol of the Commonwealth and a proud ambassador of the United Kingdom. Amongst the 220 crew, a Royal Marines band was aboard to entertain during the official visits, providing dinner music and beating retreats. Decommissioned in 1997, it was clear how much this ship meant to Her Majesty and to the rest of the Royal Family. Throughout the Queen's life, there have been times of loss and reflection. The Aberfan mining disaster in 1966. The London bomb attacks in 1982 and 2005. The fire at Windsor Castle in 1992. The death of Princess Diana in 1997. The death of her sister Margaret and the Queen Mother in 2002 and of course the death of her beloved Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, in 2021. But despite those sadder times, Her Majesty's duty to her people and the nation never wavered. Majesty celebrated many jubilees over the years, but in 2022 we celebrated her Platinum Jubilee. She was the first British monarch to reach such a milestone. Events took place around the world to mark this occasion, with London becoming the centre of celebrations. A spectacular concert at Buckingham Palace and a pageant parade down the Mall concluded a weekend of events that reinforced the Sovereign's role as a force for unity and national identity. It was announced at 6.30pm on the 8th of September 2022 that Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II had passed away peacefully at Balmoral Castle at the age of 96. The state funeral took place on the 19th of September and was attended by 2,000 people including 500 heads of state and foreign dignitaries. Around 6,000 armed forces personnel took part and an estimated one million people lined the streets. The Royal Navy played an important role, with 96 Royal Navy sailors having the honour of pulling the state gun carriage during the procession through the streets of London. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was the fabric that held a nation together. She ruled for longer than any other monarch in British history, becoming a much-loved and respected figure around the world. She fulfilled her promise, devoting her whole life to the service of her people and our great nation. 
As we look back at her remarkable life of dedication, we give thanks for the duty she's given as we start a new journey and future under the reign of King Charles III.